Uh oh. Okay, we'll start with this. You may have heard yesterday a change in course for two-time undisputed champion Terence Crawford. Three division champion overall, where initially we thought he would be using WBO super champion status to move up in weight and challenge Tim Zhu at 154 for his WBO title. He's going to move up even further to take on Chris Eubank Jr. for no title at all, as Chris is not a champion. He doesn't have a belt, but he is worth some money. Due to his namesake, no, Chris Eubank Jr. has never had the talent of a Tim Zhu, the talent of a Terrence Crawford, the ceiling, but he is a Eubank, his famous father, Chris Eubank Sr. That's made him garner attention over the years due to his namesake, that he's a Eubank. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So he screwed the pooch on what was supposed to be the Conor Ben fight. Conor Ben, a welterweight. To fight an even more decorated welterweight in Terrence Crawford. I don't understand. I mean, if he was so averse to fighting someone that much smaller than he is, a welterweight, then why would he be now fighting Terrence Crawford? For fighting a welterweight, why didn't you just fight Conor Ben? The fight was on the table. It was worth some money. We all know it was worth some money in the United Kingdom. Why didn't you go through with it? You're gonna fight a welterweight anyway. It might as well have been that one. That fight was more winnable than this one. Goes back to what I said. I noticed that Chris Eubank Sr., Chris's father, he was always averse to the Conor Ben fight. He was always opposed to it. And I'm of the opinion the reason for that is he doesn't want his legacy to be tarnished by his son. Chris Eubank Sr. has that win over Nigel Ben, Conor Ben's father. If Junior goes in there and loses to Conor, the conversation is going to change from how Eubank Sr. beat Nigel Ben all those years ago to how Conor Ben beat Chris Jr. The get back. I'm of the opinion that behind the scenes, Eubank Sr. has done and is still doing everything in his power to make sure that fight doesn't happen because he doesn't want his namesake and his legacy tarnished by his son. So if you're wondering, why did Chris walk away from the Conor Ben fight just to end up fighting Terrence Crawford? They're both welterweights. Why did he do it? Why? Why? I think it's Why? because that's what his father wanted. Because that's what his father told him to do, and he did it. That's what I think. Conor Ben himself reacted to the news by saying, Crawford will donate Bo Mack to Eubank for this fight, as he don't need a cornerman for this. For those of you that forgot, Chris Eubank Jr. enlisted the aid of Brian Bo Mack McIntyre, Terrence Crawford's longtime trainer, ahead of the Liam Smith rematch, and it does seem to have made all the difference but if he's gonna share the ring with terence crawford i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that bo mack will be in terence's corner not chris's like what we saw from andre rosier years ago andre used to train both daniel jacobs and sergey didivianchenko but when it came time for them to fight he decided to be in daniel's corner because he had a longer relationship with daniel he was in daniel's corner much longer than he was in sergey's and the same applies to bo mack and terence crawford he's been with Terrence much, much longer than he's been with Chris. I mean, you don't need me to tell you that the dynamic, the dichotomy of the relationship is different. So if this fight goes down, I expect to see Bo Mack in Terrence's corner, even though Chris is the one who needs him. Some people don't like this. What people? Spence fans that have all of a sudden become Jaron Ennis fans? What people? Fuck people. The only people that would really get upset that Terrence is moving up in weight to face Chris instead of Tim or Boots or somebody else are Spence fans. Spence fans that are still mad after all these months that they were wrong. So wrong about the Spence versus Crawford fight after years of flapping their gums and talking shit. You were wrong. Hating like a little bitch. 
isn't gonna change that. Bitch. My previous videos, we talked about how one of the only money fights left for Terence Crawford would be a Tim Zhu fight at 154 because Tim Zhu is worth some money, money domestically, in Australia. And that could pull in an international arm of revenue that, say, a Jaron Ennis can't bring in. Tim Zhu's a superstar in his country. Jaron Ennis is an email champion in his. And not a well-known one either. You can think Jaron Ennis hails the moon and the stars. You can think he's the second coming of Sugar Ray Leonard all you like. In this country, he ain't worth no money. He don't draw. And at 36 years old, having already been a three-time lineal, three-time ring magazine, two-time undisputed champion, Terrence is after the big bucks. He's after the money. I don't blame him. He's already a part of a very short list of fighters, a short list of fighters that can say they've been undisputed champions in two different divisions. He's already accomplished. When he retires, he's going in the Hall of Fame. He's a shoe in What's curious, is he's deciding to go up two weight classes instead of just one. He's deciding to go up two divisions, past 154 and past Tim Zhu, up to 160 for Chris Eubank Jr. Now, Chris Eubank, that's a money fight. That's established. He may not be anywhere near as talented as Terrence or Tim or even Jaron Ennis, for that matter. He might not be. But he is a naturally bigger guy than all those guys, and he's campaigned at much higher weights than all of them. Chris has fought at 160, he's fought at 168, and he is worth some money. So a fight between him and Terrence could generate some revenue in the United Kingdom. Maybe you do it in the UK, or maybe you do it in Saudi, then bill it as a pay-per-view in the UK. It'll drum up business. And what about the fight? What, how the fight plays out? Well, all Chris has really got going for him is that he's bigger than Terrence Crawford. That's about it. That's all he's got going for him, that he's fought at 160 and he's fought at 168 and Terrence would be moving up two divisions for this fight. I think about Jesse Bam Rodriguez Bam. and how he jumped up two weight classes on short notice to take on Carlos Quadras. I think about Canelo Alvarez, who went from middleweight all the way up to light heavyweight for Sergey Kovalev. Two weight classes. And then I think about this and I tell myself Terrence can win. Terrence can win this fight. I don't know if he knocks out Chris Eubank Jr., but I'm quite confident that he can beat him. It's a money fight. Not just a money fight, though. Not to me. I mean, if he's jumping up two divisions, two weight classes, that does bring him closer to 168, doesn't it? And who's the undisputed champion at 168? Canelo. And who is it that Terrence Crawford said he wants to fight? He's willing to go all the way up there to do it. Canelo. So maybe what this is, is Terrence Crawford landing a money fight because it is a money fight, it is, but it's also a segue to an even bigger fight, a Canelo Alvarez fight. Which is why I don't mind it. I, unlike some people, would like to see Crawford versus Canelo. If this is a segue to that, then I don't mind it at all. I'm intrigued. I like it. There are worse people to keep busy with than a naturally bigger guy who's fought at 160 and fought at 168 for Terrence. There are worse people to pick. No, I don't mind this. If it helps him prepare, if it helps him to get acclimated to heavier weights en route to Canelo, no, I don't mind it. I'd watch it. I just wonder who would broadcast it, who would air it. Chris Eubank Jr. is with Vazerman. Maybe Sky Sports pays for it? Maybe the Saudis. We'll see. In men's heavyweight news, the continued fallout of Joseph Parker's big win over Zile Chang. Chang took to his social media to say, Congratulations, Joseph Parker. You are the better man tonight. It's a pleasure sharing the ring with you. We have to see each other again, but I'm happy we both came out of the ring healthy. Thank you, Saudi Arabia. What will go down in the history books is yet another prime example of how triangle theories, triangle theories in boxing, they don't work. That just because Joe beat Joseph and just because Zhang beat Joe, that doesn't mean Zhang beats Joseph. Wait, say that again? That just because Joe beat Joseph and just because Zhang beat Joe, that doesn't mean Zhang beats Joseph. And he didn't, though he came very close. We now know that there was a rematch clause incorporated into the contract for that fight. There was a rematch clause that I imagine Zile Zhang means to now activate. It would seem that they covered all the bases, that he wasn't going to just put up his WBO interim status without some assurances. It was smart of him not to get left out in the cold in the event that he loses, kind of like how Michaela Mayer got left out in the cold for not incorporating a rematch clause into her contract with Alicia Baumgartner. She didn't cover all the bases, so she wasn't able to get a rematch. Zhang will. To that, 
Former WBO interim champion Joe Joyce said, great work, Joe Boxer Parker. Beat Zhang again, then let's run it back. Beat Zhang again, because he might have to. Beat Zhang again, because there may be a second fight, there may be a rematch, and I'm not against it. I'm all for it. I enjoyed the aesthetic of this past weekend's fight. A second one would be intriguing. A second fight might be all right, because the adjustment that Zhang has to make isn't really a big one. He just has to throw more. He has to work harder to open up Joseph Parker and get more of those left hands in, which I think he can. Funny old game, this boxing, how styles make fights and triangle theories don't work. That just because Zhang beat Joe and just because Joe beat Joseph, that didn't necessarily mean that Zhang would beat Joseph. That's a tongue twister. Think that Zile Zhang has more power more single punching power than Joe Joyce. And I think that's what was evident in the fight between them. That Zhang is a bigger puncher, but not a more prolific puncher. Not as busy a puncher as Joe Joyce. Joe Joyce's activity worked against him with Zile Zhang, but it worked for him with Joseph Parker. He really laid into Parker. He landed a lot of punches. He was busy round after round, just mowing him down. Throwing punches in bunches as opposed to Zhang, who while Zhang is stronger, He's also more economic. He doesn't throw as much. Funny how that breaks down. Being economic and working off the counter worked for Zhang against Joe Joyce, but it worked against him with Joseph Parker. He wasn't throwing enough. He wasn't doing enough. So in a rematch, he's got to make a slight adjustment. He's got to do more, throw more. Now you know you can hurt Joseph Parker. Now you know you can wound him. You just have to finish him, which is what makes a second fight intriguing. Joseph Parker, better than advertised. An underrated fighter that's proving that fight by fight and a victory that's aging well, quite well for Anthony Joshua, who for years was entangled in this rivalry with Deontay Wilder, who Joseph Parker beat, who Joseph Parker beat in one-sided fashion. Well, I'm aware triangle theories don't work that because Joseph beat Wilder. That by itself doesn't mean Anthony beats Wilder. Not that Not by that itself. Though so I will say, <laughs> I've had Anthony Joshua beating Deontay Wilder for years. I've had Anthony beating Wilder before Tyson Fury beat Wilder, before Joseph Parker beat Wilder. It's a separate conversation. Based on his recent activity, his string of victories, how busy he was, was last year the big win over wilder the more recent win over zile zhang when this era comes to a close and people remember it unless something changes and wilder has a surge of his own joseph parker's going to be ranked ahead of him i could see that he's wbo interim champion he's close to becoming a two-time heavyweight champion he just has to beat zile zhang again rematches are often won by the fighter that can make the most adjustments. And to Joseph Parker's credit, he's more cerebral than he's given credit for. He's more cerebral than people realize, and he is a kind of fighter that can make adjustments. But I thought you said Zhang can adjust too. He can, that's what makes a second fight intriguing. That's what makes a rematch worth watching. That Joseph Parker is the kind of fighter that can make adjustments from one fight to the next, but Zhang, he doesn't have to make all that big of an adjustment either. He just has to throw more. That's it. This really is quite the surge from Joseph Parker. Rebounding off that loss to Joe Joyce. He's on a five fight winning streak. Great example of how activity matters. The more you do something, the better you become at it. The less you do it, the harder it becomes to do. Joseph Parker's surge has everything to do with how often he's fighting. He's sharp, experienced, and resilient. Congratulations to him, and we'll see if he can keep the train going, keep that momentum. Just in keeping with the theme of all things heavyweight, veteran manager Sam Jones said that punch from AJ last night would have laid out a hippo. If everyone's honest, it did just highlight how poor Tyson was when he boxed in Ganu, and AJ showed how to deal with a novice. I think we will see the best version of Fury next time against Usyk and becomes undisputed. Then we see Fury versus AJ in one of the biggest fights ever. This guy's dreaming. He seems to me like one of these people that has a soft spot for Fury that can't see the forest through the trees because Anthony Joshua outdoing Tyson Fury against a common opponent is not an isolated incident. It's not isolated to Francis Ngannou. It's not even isolated to Otto Valin. Did you forget about him? Or Vladimir Klitschko, or Dillian White, or Kingpin Johnson. They have quite a few common opponents, and what's consistent 
is that Anthony consistently does better against those guys. You think AJ did better against Dillian and Tyson Fieri? I think AJ fought an unbeaten Dillian White that had never been knocked out before. That's what I think. I think the Dillian White that Tyson Fieri fought had already been knocked out by Anthony Joshua, had already been knocked out by Alexander Povetkin. Well, I don't think it. I know it. Just like I know that Anthony Joshua didn't have to labor or go the distance with Francis Ngannou. He didn't have to labor or go the distance with Otto Wallin and get his face sliced up in the process. So of what you're telling yourselves to feel better. No, oh, Fury was poor. He was poor with Ngannou, but he was just poor with Ngannou. He was poor with Otto Wallin too. That was right before he fought Wilder. The great Deontay Wilder. Maybe what it is, is you've been giving him far too much credit for fighting Deontay Wilder, for beating Deontay Wilder, who I've been telling you the whole time is a limited fighter with poor coordination, poor cardio. Two left feet. You need an example of what I'm talking about. They built him a statue for beating Deontay Wilder. They built him a statue for beating the man. So you'll excuse me when I say that that victory was blown out of proportion. A fucking statue. The Fury fans are out in full force trying to save face for him the way they usually do in these situations. One guy who goes by the name David S. said, LOL, AJ ain't better than Fury, and you know it. Y'all man are bugging, Fury is washed like Wilder. So you can say that's always been Fury's level. If bangs AJ and Usyk, you man will start saying it's a weak era, haters gonna hate. You hear this guy? I'm a hater because I was right. I told you that AJ was gonna beat Otto Valin easy. I told you that AJ was gonna beat Francis Ngannou easy. Two guys Fury struggled with. I have Anthony Joshua beating Tyson Fury. I have Anthony Joshua knocking him out. And in case you're thinking to yourself, isn't that a triangle theory? Well, it stops being a triangle when you have more than one common opponent. When you have something like four or five common opponents, it's not a triangle anymore. Stop being a triangle a long time ago. Did you see Fury's reaction to the knockout? Did you see his face? Did you see how much his mouth was moving? The blubbering lard ass was high out of his mind. In truth, he's been high out of his mind for months now. You guys just don't know what to look for. You don't know what the signs are. Do you want to sermonize to me about who I should pick to win a fight? Yeah. I've had Anthony Joshua beating Tyson Fury. I still have Anthony Joshua beating Tyson Fury, but I have Usyk beating him first. He's not winning in May. If he does fight, I don't have him winning that fight. I have Oleksandr Usyk beating him. I have Oleksandr Usyk potentially stopping him. He's not what you think he is. You just don't want to read the writing on the wall, but it's there. He's not what you think he is. He's not who you think he is. And that anyone from this David S. guy to Sam Jones, Sam Jones himself, wants to keep gaslighting people about the greatness of Tyson Fury? That fucking pipe dream. If you believe it so much, why do you get so defensive whenever AJ fights? Why do you get like this whenever he fights a common opponent with Tyson Fury? I know. It's because you notice what I notice. AJ makes it look easy. At least in the last two fights. The Otto Valine fight, the Francis Ngannou fight, AJ makes it look easy. Against guys that Tyson Fury labors with. That's not a triangle theory. Triangle theories rely on one common opponent, not several. AJ makes it look easy. What are you worrying about AJ for anyway? Tyson Fury's not about to fight AJ. He's about to fight Usyk, and I think... Usyk's gonna beat him. But fear not. Even if Usyk beats him, I think he's gonna fight Anthony. I think he's gonna fight Anthony for the money. Cocaine is expensive. It's an expensive habit. 